we're going to start in to the post-ark experience of Noah and, and try to travel forward until we get to the place where we understand the table of the nations and the Babel story and, and we're heading for Abraham. That's where we're trying to get. Now, with that in mind, we're going to be talking about what changed in Noah's life when he left the ark. And I want to take a few moments and pray as we begin today. Um, I'm really asking the Lord to, to work in our lives and to be working on the changes that we need to be having inside. It's, there's a temptation and it's going to come into your life. If it's not already there, it's going to come fast. And the temptation is going to be to turn the study of God's word into some math or history book where you just kind of are chunking off the assignments and you're just getting into this. I will tell you that you already need to be in Job. If you're not there, you're going to find yourself caught by surprise with 40-some chapters that come and just get you in a day. Okay? So be working all the way through in the upcoming uh, opportunities because really you're going to find that the, the three dialogue sets in, in Job will get you caught up in something and God doesn't really speak until chapter 38 and that's when it really gets, really gets cool. There's, there's methodology to all of this, and we're going to take some time and talk about the method, but my concern is that I'm pushing you ahead to try and get into Scripture. Now, before we pray, let me just make one point that I think is incredibly important, and I don't know that I made it strongly. I have gotten an inordinate number of um, young people who have written, I think it probably came because I was speaking at youth conferences and stuff this year, but an inordinate number of young people that have been writing to me as this school year has begun, both in places like James Madison University and in places like our local high school, where they seem to be, my feeling is that there's an all-out assault on the Bible and Christianity. I'm getting all kinds of students that are writing to me going, my teacher just got up and said that if I believe the Bible, I'm an idiot. And there's just, I don't know if it's intensifying or if it's just all the people in my life it's intensifying for, but I can tell you that my email and messaging has been filled with students who are going, I don't get it. And one of the questions that keeps coming up is a question that you should already have grasped, but I didn't take the time to really look at it, so you may not have seen it. You're not looking at a record of Adam through Noah. What you've seen so far is not that. You've seen a record from the time of Moses, 1,500 years before Jesus, thousands of years after Adam ever was. Okay? And what you're looking at is a tiny little window that you're looking through. In other words, most people in history are not in the Bible. But here's the problem. The way the Genesis is written in the scrolls there's a point that I think must be made and it must be solid in your mind. The biblical writer only tells you the part of the story he's going to pick up. So, what's the classic professor in college says, well, who did Cain and Abel marry? Because there's no other ch children mentioned. But clearly there are other children there. The biblical writer isn't trying to tell you every time um, Adam and Eve had a baby. But it sounds like he is. He'll say, Adam knew his wife again, and they had another child. And Eve says, this replaces the one that I lost. And so you think, oh, that's the next time they had a baby. No, that's just the next one in the story he's going to tell you about. The other babies were coming and going like crazy. I mean, these people were like rabbits, okay? They were having babies left and right, but... But the writer doesn't get caught up every other page. And then there was this person, then this person, then this person born. And then there was this person, then this person first. So I want you to remember that the biblical record is sliced down. You get from creation to Abraham in 11 chapters. What does that tell you about how much stuff got cut from what God gave to Moses? God didn't want to give Moses every story about every person and where they moved and whether they stubbed their toe and whether or not they had a... a, a a uh, iron deficiency, or whether they like broccoli. There's a lot of stuff not in the Bible, okay? Don't feel like that's a weakness. Feel like that's the intent of the writer. A Middle Eastern writer isn't trying to tell you everything. They're only trying to tell you what they're trying to tell you. A classic example of that is like the Gospel of Mark, where 
Mark will say, and immediately Jesus did this, and then immediately Jesus did this, and immediately Jesus did that. He's not saying the next thing Jesus did was the next thing he wrote. He might have done three things in between. What he's telling you is the next thing I want to tell you about is the next thing I'm writing. So I want you to think of the people in Genesis for the first 10 chapters, not as all the people that are born, but all the people that carry the story. I want you to pretend there's an Olympic stadium filled with people, but the only focus is on the guy with the baton snapping the baton into the hand of the next runner. And the whole story seems to be about the line of runners and the baton when there's a million people in the stadium, but nobody's talking about them. And the point that I'm making is that I feel like a lot of a lot of young people are being stumped with this, where do dinosaurs fit? It's never the intention of the biblical writer. Moses is not trying to tell you everything that happened. Eons of stuff go on and, and literally whole uh, epics of human history go on and he didn't talk about them. So why should you? Don't go into a science classroom and start making statements about things you only have half a line on. Okay? God didn't explain it. Here's the reality. Either there's a God who created or there isn't. Either all things came together because of an intelligent design or we are all here by happenstance and I am another form of a virus. That is, that's the truth. Either there is a cosmogony of revelation or there's a cosmogony of naturalism. And in our current state of education, everybody believes in the religion of naturalism. You're not allowed to teach in our schools anything but naturalism. So it's bullying if I look at you and say, you think you're gay and somebody said something against you, I've got to defend you because that's bullying. But if you think that there's a God, I can bully you from the pulpit of my own classroom. See how it's working? The further we go, the, there's one thing being isolated as the problem of society, the God myth. And if we can target the God myth, we can rebuild morality into anything we want it to be. And that's what's going on. I share that with you because I want you to understand we weren't trying to give you a primer against which you could stand up. You want to know about Creationism Institute for Creation Research, Ken Ham, there's a bunch of guys who write on that. I'm not really doing that. I'm writing on and I'm teaching on how does the beginning chapters, how do the beginning chapters of the Bible affect how I live? Where's the key to the map of life for me? because it's my theory that that's the primary important part of the text. I'm not saying it's not important to believe the text as literally true. I believe the text is literally true. But I also know that God really wasn't trying to give us a science lesson on dinosaurs. That's just not the point of the text. I think they're in there. I just, I, I, I am really not going to try and give you, well, how does it all fit together? Because I don't think that's really the point. I do think there are other guys out there and that's what they're going to do. I'm fine with that. I sort of lit up on that only because I'm concerned that um, we, can get, we can start riding through the year and you can forget what it is we're trying to do. I'm looking for consistent principles of a changeless God that I can live today. Okay? So if I figure out the timeline of creation and I know exactly where dinosaurs are, how does that actually change? Have, have any of you been in a, in a theological discussion which it was a fever pitch theology discussion and when everybody walked out, nobody lived any better? We, we can talk about theory all day long. I don't want to. I want the Spirit of God to change your life. And I think when you open the Bible, that's its purpose. And I think if that's not what's happening in your Bible study, it's not a Bible study. It's an argument. And I think there's an awful lot of arguments that substitute as Bible study. Now, I'm not saying I don't want you to engage your mind. Clearly, you know, I come from an academic background and I, I really want you to have a clarity about your academics. But don't get lost in that. I want you to understand full heads won't answer the problems of empty hearts. It's not going to happen. If the Spirit of God is moving and you're willing to accept that he's on the throne and he's running things, then how he got it done is really not a big deal. It's really not. And people will try to get you distracted in every possible thing, but they will not actually deal with the first line. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I keep making a, a comparison that I set up, and I don't want to make any of you uncomfortable, and it's too early in the year to know if you are. But um, 
I talk about theological development and biblical development, and I put them in two different planes. Let me see if I can illustrate for a moment what I see the difference as, because I don't want you to hear something different than I'm saying. How many of you know somebody who is on the other side of some theological debate, but you know they're believers? You know they know the Lord, but they disagree with you on some critical area of biblical debate. Anybody like that? Okay, I'm a dad. My kids are your age. So let's say a young man uh, wants to, to come and court my daughter, and he comes to me and he says, I want to marry your daughter. And I look at this man. Do you think I'm more worried about whether he's an infralapsarianist or a supralapsarianist, or do you think I'm more worried about whether or not he loves Jesus and walks with him and exudes the, the, the fruit of the Spirit? Which of those two do you think I'm more concerned about? Now, this was an easy softball, guys. If you're Now, some of you are going, you're lost on the infralapse area. Forget it. You don't even care what that is. Do you think I'm worried about whether or not he agrees with my development of the book of Romans or whether or not he's going to be loving, kind, outreaching, gracious, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness? What do you, what do you think I'm going to be more concerned about? Okay, if I'm more concerned about the second one, does it not say as a father that I take the fruit of the Spirit and put it up here with godliness and I take the theology and subvert it as a secondary issue? In other words, you or I may not agree on all the theology. That's okay with me. But you better agree on modesty. You better agree on truth. You better agree on integrity. You better agree on gentleness. You better agree on compassion because the work of the Spirit is not up for grabs. Whether I understand all the text correctly and whether or not we agree on all that is not what's important. It's whether or not we're living as a reflection of Jesus Christ. Later on, we're going to get to a place in Scripture where Paul comes and um, he gets to a place called Ptolemaeus. And when he gets there, he's filled with the Spirit of God and he's going to set his face toward Jerusalem. And some prophets who are filled with the Spirit come to him and say, don't go to Jerusalem. Now, why is that an important little snapshot? Because two people filled with the Spirit of God doesn't mean they agree on which way to go. You can disagree on many things, but you don't disagree on the Great Commission. You don't disagree on godliness. You disagree on whether or not Paul should go. Paul was going there, and they were saying, don't go there, you'll be arrested. And Paul was going there knowing he'd be arrested. What, what they didn't know was God's call in Paul's life. What they knew was that they had been warned by the Spirit that that was going to happen. Why would God warn these prophetesses of what is going to happen to Paul, and then they tell Paul, and Paul ignores them? Why would he do that? Because when he's arrested, there was already a prophecy back here showing it wasn't God caught by accident. It was Paul doing something, even though the consequences were already known. In other words, God was settling the church by, by stirring them up. Sometimes he stirs you up so he can settle you later and say, see, that's what I told you. That's what I meant. Jesus told his disciples repeatedly he was going to die. And yet, when he was on the cross, they were all mystified. Why, did, why does the gospel record tell you that over and over, five times in Mark's gospel, he said, I'm going to die. Then he's on the cross and they're all like, what happened? Our master died. Yeah, maybe see the five times I told you it was going to happen? The point is, God speaks into our lives so that when later on he can recall that which he said, he can stabilize us. Okay? I want to go to Genesis chapter 9. I want to open up uh, in the beginning with, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever heard this, but a cynical comedian one time said that Milton wrote the book Paradise Lost and then his wife died and he wrote another book called Paradise Regained. I, I always thought that was a kind of an interesting uh, insight. That's obviously not a biblical view of marriage, but it does set up the story of Noah walking off the ark because in a way, God met Noah at the beginning of the new adventure as the door opened to the ark and paradise was regained. Now, I, I, want, you to, I want to look at, uh, in chapter 9, the beginnings of some new instructions God gave him. Because in redemption, now you guys are not here for the, the, the destruction of the earth and you're not on an ark, but in a very real way, you've come to know Jesus and you have a new life. 
And when you open up the door of your own ark and walk off and Jesus is now your savior, there are instructions that you need to understand. I want to ask you an honest question and I want you to be honest with me. Have you ever found yourself pulling on a door that said push? <laughs> or pushing on a door that said pull? And realizing that there are at least three people behind you going, honestly, this person is an idiot. Has anybody done this beside me? All right. Here's what I want you to see at the beginning of chapter 9. Your new life with God comes with instructions. That's the principle. Your new life comes with instructions. Let me give you some of the five big change instructions that are in chapter 9. And the first one is that you get new responsibilities. And what I mean by that is I'm looking at verses, uh, verse 1 and verse 7 where it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God said it again in more elaborate terms in Genesis 9, 9, 7, where he said, as for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply it. Now, when you read this, the first thing that changed in, in Noah's life was new responsibilities. He had a new responsibility. When God renewed the world, Noah got off the boat. We all agree on that? Otherwise, he's still stuck there somewhere. He got off the boat, and it was time to face a new responsibility. So what did God say to him? Get busy, have kids, fill the place. Now, for some of you, you're going, okay, that's not really difficult. That's an easy task. Go out and have babies. All right, we can do that. Nothing really hard there. Seemed pretty simple. But from Noah's perspective, stop for a second and think about what God is saying. Noah saw the earth full before, and it wasn't pretty. In Noah's experience, it wasn't fun to repopulate the earth. The last time the earth was populated, it was filled with terrible people. So I'm thinking maybe he's a little gun shy. How about you? I'm thinking that um, people that have just been through an earthquake don't want to sleep out inside. They want to sleep outside because they're afraid the building's going to fall on them. 600 years of life was probably wearing Noah out. I'm thinking you get to be 600, you, lo you lose that youthful zip, and I think you just kind of go, do they have like super mega geritol, you know, for the 600 year olds among us? I, I, in all seriousness, I think watching everything in life that he ever knew destroyed. I want you to remember these words from Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine living in that group of people? I I'm saying, this guy is getting instructions to go out there and start it all again, and what he remembers of it wasn't good. He doesn't remember. I run into people sometimes who I'll say, you know, well, yeah, welcome to, you know, I'd like to invite you to Grace Church, and I I'd really like to... to, to you to come and they'll say, I don't, I don't want to go back to a church. I had such a terrible experience in a church. I can't bring myself to go back. I don't think there was a worse experience in humanity than the experience that Noah saw when people thought only evil continually and he watched them all wiped out. I think being a preacher of righteousness to a doomed generation was no picnic. That's what I'm saying. I think if you're getting out there and you're telling everybody this is what God wants and everybody goes the other way, I'm thinking you're going to start thinking, that, you know, listen, if you make a product and nobody buys it, I'm thinking that says something about how you feel about yourself. God helped Noah focus in verse 1 on something. What was it? He says, be fruitful and multiply. What's the focus? How is God changing the game for Noah? This is like the interactive part, jump in at any time. Th think about it this way. Everybody he knew died besides his family. The world as he knew it was crushed. And God focused him on the future, not the past. Getting off the boat, he didn't say, I want you to stand over the mountains and mourn for those that are lost. He said, get out there and make some new ones. And, and I think we forget how hard that was. In your new life, you get a new set of responsibilities, and they continue and include gaining the strength to share with others and to multiply. That's part of the pro process. Um, 
There's a study that I want to mention to you, and I don't know if you'll grasp why I'm doing it, but back in 2002, the Lilly Foundation sponsored a survey that involved interviews with 300,000 uh, churchgoers to 2,200 different churches. They represented eight different denominations across the spectrum, and they found that three quarters of the churchgoers reported they came to church the first time because somebody invited them. Does, does that sound right? Three quarters of the people that got into the church got there because somebody invited them, right? Interestingly enough, 54% of them had not invited anyone to church within the last year. Okay, so here's what they're saying. I got here because somebody invited me, but I don't invite people. Does anybody see a problem with the future? If I bet I could get up on Sunday morning, right there, I bet I could get up and say, how many of you came to a church service the very first time, or, or you came to Jesus through some Bible study or something that you were invited to? I'll bet you the vast majority of people would raise their hand, don't you think? Now, if I turn that around and said, and when was the last time you invited somebody? I'd like to see your hand if it's been the last week, the last month, the last six months. Don't lie to me. Be honest. God's looking at your hand. What do you think would happen in the room? I think what we'd find out is that that statistic isn't, isn't untrue that apparently a lot of Christians don't invite people to come to Jesus and that whole free, fruit, be fruitful and multiply thing in the spiritual context doesn't work in their life. L let me ask you something. There was a, a philosopher, um, Francois Fenelon, who said to just read the Bible, to attend church and avoid the big sins, is that what God meant by a wholehearted, passionate love for Jesus Christ? Do you, do you know how many believers that that's really their goal? I'm just going to read my Bible and avoid all the big sins, and that's the Christian life. That's, that's, that's the difference between two people who live in the same house and a marriage. It's not the same thing. Less than 3% of non-Christian people in the world ever walk into a church without an invitation. We're called to be fruitful and multiply spiritually. You did not choose me. I chose you that you would go and bear fruit, Jesus said. But you know what? I really believe that the Great Commission, I believe the Great Commission can only be fulfilled by people who are passionate about their walk with Jesus and therefore show it in their life. I don't think evangelism is a program. I think it's an overflow of your walk with God and most people don't have one. Even people who know God don't have one. Therefore, they're not overflowing with anything. They're struggling with their own sin issues and they're not overflowing with anything and that's why the world doesn't see it. I think that lukewarm people attend church regularly because that's the expected thing to do. I think they give to charity. I think they help little old ladies across the street because it's the popular and right thing to do. But here's the thing. I think they hear about a radical commitment for God, but they believe it belongs to somebody else, not them. Am I wrong? Would somebody, somebody challenge that? Or do you think that's really what's happening? Rooms full of believers who hear somebody sold out, but it's not me today because I got issues. You don't understand, I, I got issues. I think one of the problems we have to understand, you know, if you turn flesh around and drop a letter, you get self. It's really the same thing. And I think one of the problems we have is that we know that our whole lives are to be surrendered to Jesus and what he calls us to do, but we don't do it. I, I wonder if the reason we don't we don't go out and invite people to Jesus or to the church is that um, that would add to our responsibilities. What do I mean by that? Tell me what I just said. How would it add to your responsibility if you said to a dear friend, I really want to invite you to Jesus Christ? How does that change your responsibility? You feel responsible for them? All of a sudden you think they're going to start watching my life. As long as I don't tell him anything, I, I don't have to live up to anything. I remember my son, I, I love my son, but he, he has a couple of characteristics that always made me smile. Um, one time he got an A on a quiz and his mom said, see, I'm telling you, I know you can do it. And he goes, yeah, but I know if I do it, then you're going to expect one on the next one. And I always appreciated that. My wife came to me one time and said, this kid is driving me crazy. He won't clean up his room. So I went to him and I said, Aaron, you're driving your mom crazy. You're not cleaning up your room. And he said, yeah, because she always cleans it. I figure if it's going to get done for me, why would I do it? Does everybody understand the logic behind this? 
So some people excuse their, um, their whole desire or their whole command to go reach other people for Christ because the Spirit of God is going to do it. It's just, it's, they're predestined, they'll just come. Well, that's nice. So all that talk, talk about go and make disciples, what does that mean to you? If it's all just going to be kez, sarah, sarah, whatever will be, will be, that's convenient, but you just got off the hook. Let me say this. Some people use their theology as an excuse for disobedience. Some people literally think that their theology excuses them from the text. Never get to the place where God owes you something, where he has to do it your way because you already figured out how he works. Don't do that, because here's what I've seen. I study all the way through the book every year, and I'm going to tell you God surprises me every year. He does. And almost everybody in this book was surprised by God. Okay, first, you get new responsibilities. What, give me an example of a new responsibility that you had after you came to Christ and Jesus was, was center, the centerpiece of your heart. What's an example of a responsibility? People are holding you accountable. Okay. So all of a sudden, I become responsible for showing Jesus with my life. I can't, I live in a small town and I, I came from a capital city. I moved from Jerusalem to Sebring. They're almost exactly the same, except for totally and entirely different. And here's the thing. I know now that if I, the other day, I went into a store and I bought something and what they sold me didn't work. If I go throw a fit in that store, somebody half a town away will know Pastor Randy threw a fit before I get home. When I step out and become a representative of Jesus Christ, People are going to see me before they see Jesus in me. And if I get in the way, all of a sudden they don't see Jesus. Okay, let me go on because I think there's another one here. Look at verse 2. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky and everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. We're talking about something that happens in your new life. Tell me, looking at verse 2, what changed for Noah? What is that change? Can anybody pick it out? I love it. There's always a carnivore out there who goes, yeah, now he can kill animals and eat meat. Yeah, but I want you to think of what just changed. His relationship to the animals just changed. How did it change? They were his friends. The animals didn't eat each other or the people on the ark. But coming off the ship, they will no longer walk up to you. Now they will run from you. Your relationship will change with the animal world. Now, how does that apply to you? Well, in the same way, in a spiritual way, that your relationships change when you come to know the Lord. When your new life begins, your relationships change. Does anybody know what relationships change? Like, your mom's still your mom. You can't go, well, I know Jesus now, and you're not my mom. I mean, that's not how it works. But some things change. Did anybody have a relationship with a really good friend that just changed after you came to know Jesus and he started to work in your life? You know, all of a sudden, some people that you used to hang out with, some things you thought were funny aren't funny. And some, some people, you realized they're actually subtracting, they're bleeding me out like a spiritual mosquito. I'm, I'm losing when I'm around them. And I don't mean that to be, uh, I don't mean that to be mean. I guess that sounds mean. But I guess here's the thing. Your longtime friends sound different to you when you come to Jesus. And, and do you remember 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a verse you might know. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, here's the thing. You need to be careful with that verse. Not everything passed away. When you came to Jesus, whatever you owed on your car, you still owe. Okay? Citibank doesn't go, well, now that you're a believer, we'll just cancel all that you owe on your credit card. It doesn't work that way. But it also doesn't work that way with your waistline. If you exercise too little and eat too much and you come to Jesus, you're still fat. And, and how do you get rid of it? The same way you would have got rid of it if you didn't know Jesus. You take down the intake and take up the outtake. If that is even a word, I think I just created something. Now, here's the point. 
Um, it's really important that we understand our relationships are going to change. And it's worth noting that when you make a commitment to Christ, it takes time for some things to change. Your reputation doesn't die just because your life has been made new spiritually. If you were a jerk the week before you came to Christ, you're still known as a jerk the week after. Jesus may forgive you, but the people in your life still think that you're the jerk you were last week. If you grow up in a home where a parent is abusive and then they come to Jesus Christ, it does not mean the children suddenly all forgive them for years of abuse. Because people remember the pain you cause in their life. I want you to remember one sentence. If you forget everything else I just said, remember this one sentence. The most important thing you leave behind at the end of a conversation is how the other person felt. In a conversation, the most important thing you leave behind is not the details of what you said, but how you made them feel. So in every one of your exchanges today, can you think through how am I making them feel? When you witness for Jesus Christ, make sure you un understand that principle that people really need to know that I care about them. People do not care what you know until they know that you care about them. That's the truth. And it's a deep and real truth of communication. Now, the other thing I would say is um, that, that there's a new change in your life in another way. And this one kind of goes to your point. Um, verse 3, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all that to you as I gave the green plant. It appears to me, and many scholars agree, that uh, I, up until chapter 9, verse 2, that people were vegetarian. Please do not take that word and go, therefore, the godly people are vegetarian. Because verse 3 says you don't have to be. And God doesn't tell you to, to stop doing something if he, do, if he really minds you stopping to do it. So here's the point. He says that not only your relationship with the animals change, but your diet changes. And the diet change is one I want you to think about. Biblically speaking, our diet is what we take inside ourselves. Does everybody understand that? Whether it's physical diet or spiritual diet, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. There's a father up above who is looking down. You know what I'm saying? So... Here's the thing. I want you to remember a principle. You write it somewhere or at least write it on your heart. Sin is an appetite that intensifies when you feed it. The fact is, when God calls us to himself, he carefully warns us to regulate the intake valves of our life. Our diet is different because we know him. The world's diet is not our diet. Now here's the problem. Every Christian I know wants to know whatever's newest on television, the newest movie that's out, the newest style that's out. How is that not consuming exactly whatever the world is consuming? Do you have to know all the latest shows to be relevant and reach out? Because I hear that all the time. Well, I don't want to be irrelevant. I, I want to be able to reach people with the cutting edge. We actually have people introducing their sermons now from pulpits based on movies that were filled with bad language and bad living. What did you communicate to the crowd? After you're done your sermon and it's been real relevant and edgy and you're up there with your t-shirt and your little tattoo so you can show you how to pass life. After you're done being all relevant to people, what did they take away? They took away that that guy in the pulpit is watching the same movie I am. Now, that may relate you to them, but it doesn't relate them to Christ. You don't have to know every bad word and what it means to relate people to Christ. Some of this might be personality. I realize, and I, guys, I, I sympathize with you, and it's going to get worse as the year goes on, especially when we get in the law. I realize that I'm a really geeky person who lives in my own head. I know this. I realize that most people really don't understand. I, I was sitting there this morning glorying in the Roman world. And a little old lady come up to me and Bob Evans, hi, Pastor Randy. And I was somewhere else. I was living at the time of Augustus. I was there. I mean, I was typing away. I was there. I'm explaining how the, the Imperium works in the Roman society in a piece of writing that no one's ever going to read. But I was fascinated and I wanted to write it down so it'd come through my fingers. I get it. I was never hip. I was never hip when hip was hip. I was never hip. 
And all I'm saying to you is you don't need to know all the, it's okay to be in a conversation where somebody is saying something with a double meaning and you don't get it. That doesn't make you stupid. To the pure, all things are pure. It's possible that, hey, do you know anybody who every time they speak, there's a second language that they're speaking? You're talking this, but they're really talking, you know, groin humor. And you're like, I don't really think I get that. That doesn't make you naive. There's nothing wrong with that. What we've lost in America is a blush. Nobody blushes anymore. Now we parade out every kind of uh, behavior and nobody's supposed to go, gee, that's awkward. Some people really need to learn that it's okay to be awkward. And I think believers need to go back and go, that, that's really not something I could discuss with other people. I, I would feel like that's very personal. How is it that we lost everything personal in our society? I want you to remember something. The world system has developed an opposing sense of wisdom to the wisdom of God. Do you remember that there are three things that you're fighting? Every, every day there are three battles going on. Who are they against? I'm sorry? Okay, world flesh devil. Okay? When we say you're fighting against the world, we don't mean you're walking out going, I hate plants. I mean, that's not, that, that's not the world we're talking about. We're not saying you dislike being a member of the planet. You are a human, and that's a good thing. We're not trying to make you, Christian is not human. You know, that, that's not what we're saying. The world system is a system in fallen values, moral statements, and ideas that are set up to answer life apart from God. So, for instance, in, in Colossians 2.8, it says, Beware lest anyone spoil you through the philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. 1 John 3.13, Marvel not, brothers, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. The point is that the world system sets itself up in opposition to God. So when you have a new diet, you need to select out of the world what you're going to listen to. Is it possible as a believer that you might have to say to yourself, other people can listen to that song, but I can't. That song isn't for me. I heard it once. It takes my mind to a place it shouldn't go. I just won't listen to it. Does anybody have an artist they won't even, they won't, if it's them, they don't even want to hear it. I don't mean you just don't like their style. I mean, you don't like where they go. You don't like what they're about. Now, there's another change. Let me give you change number four. Change number four is new values. New values. And I, I get this. Look at verses four through six. It says, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. Circle the word blood put an asterisk in the column next to it. This is the beginning of a huge, huge, huge story of the Bible. Never eat blood. Do you understand why the enemy in your high school years went dog crazy on vampire stories? Because one of the things that will destroy people's understanding of the story of God's word is to demean the idea of ingesting blood. Don't eat blood. Surely I will require your life blood from every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheds man's blood by man shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. That's not just a statement of capital punishment. That's not the whole purpose of the statement. The purpose of the statement is to say life is sacred, don't take life flippantly, or I will kill you. People matter to God. And the value is so important, God put his stamp on people. Listen to me. Your value is not in how cute you are. You're cute, but that's not your value. Because God, I got to tell you, your cuteness will come and go over different times. Uh, over the period of your life, there are some days you're just not going to look cute. See, Randy. Um, it just, it happens. It's okay. It's all right. And I'm going to tell you, ladies, you have been subject to a barrage of you are worth what your body looks like. And I, I apologize to you for that. Because your beauty isn't that. Gentlemen, let me, let me ask you to do something as you deal with these ladies. Um, 
as you deal with them all year long, the way to deal honorably with these ladies, look at the eyes and ask, who's the little girl inside there? Who's the little girl inside? Because here's what I want you to understand. The body changes, but the person isn't the body. And Satan will try to objectify. They're not a piece of meat. They're a person. And I say that, and I say it deliberately, because I want, I want you ladies to know you, don't, you, you can be very comfortable. I will think honorably of you every time I think of you. But I've been doing this a long time. So guys, let me just say this. It gets easier. As you learn to look at the beauty that's inside, you learn not to be distracted by the beauty that's outside. It is my belief that God so programmed us, gentlemen, that we like and respond and want what we see on them. They're not like us. They smell better. They look prettier. They certainly smell better. And the fact of the matter is that we are designed that way. And whether it's a statue or a person, you're drawn and your eyes and desires are drawn. There's nothing wrong with that desire. It's only... Satan takes a desire God put in us and he torques it to find fulfillment some way other than the way God said it should be fulfilled. So, so my value system determines how I meet the desires of my heart. So as a result, it's not the quality of life that makes a person valuable. It's their creator that makes them valuable. You, do you understand that if you live in a country where there is no creator, they will kill indiscriminately? Because they're going to say, that person is old. That person's a quadriplegic. That person is retarded. They offer nothing to society because value is no longer about the breath of God in them. Let me, go, let me give you another one. Let me give you the fifth change of five, okay? The fifth one I get from verses 8 through 19. Big chunk, okay? And this is new promises. One of the things you get is not only a new value system and a new diet and new responsibilities. I, I, get, I get new promises, God told Noah that he could count on the fact that condemnation like he had just seen would not happen again. God provided a sign that people could see. What was the sign of Noah? A rainbow. So verse 8, it says, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, birds, cattle, every beast of the field of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. Verse 11, I will establish my covenant with you. Now, I want you to look at that word covenant for a minute. The word covenant, in, uh, in Hebrew, it's something, a covenant is not something that you make. It's something that you cut. You cut a covenant. The idea is that a covenant is something that is costly. It's a pledge that has a cost value to it. And it's interesting, he said, I establish my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of that covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I want you to notice that what God promised was all successive generations, not just some of them. So, we can count on this. He goes back in verse 15 and says, my covenant. In verse 16, the everlasting covenant. In verse 17, the sign of the covenant. It's very clear what he's doing here. Seven times in this passage, God uses the word covenant. Circle the word covenant. Go to verse 9, circle covenant. Go to verse 11, circle covenant. 12, circle covenant. 13, circle covenant. 14, circle covenant. 16, circle covenant. 17 circle covenant. You're going to end up with seven times he uses the word covenant in the text. Now, you're going to learn that in 1, 1 to 2, 3, the story was of seven days, and that's a completion statement. So when you see something mentioned seven times in a text, it's a completion statement. That is, God's done with this. It's not going to happen, and I made a promise, and I made it sevenfold. The word barit Barit is actually the word, that's the word translated covenant. Let me write that one down for you. This is an important word, and so you're going to want to know it. Barit, and T-H is also a T. Barit is actually the word for cutting. 
So literally, God cuts a covenant. He sacrifices something to offer covenant to men. God sacrificed his absolute right to completely destroy men at the time of their sinning. That's what he sacrificed. He, he made a sacrifice there. He said, I will never again give you what you deserve. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to introduce grace. God told Noah that he had a new life, but he also told him to follow him. I, I want to close this with a story that I took from Francis Chan out of Crazy Love. And I found it to be um, really interesting. But before I do, let me just mention a, a pastor went to a, an advertising firm and he asked the advertising firm, how do I get the message out about our church? And how do I really, really change the neighborhood? Be, you know, we've got a great message. We've got a, a good church. How do we really reach our neighborhood? You're an advertising guy. Tell me, do we need radio? Do we need TV? Do we need billboards? What do we need? And the guy said, you only need one billboard. And the pastor said, that doesn't make any sense. He said, oh, you need only one. And you can build it on your own lot. Oh, and by the way, turn it so that it faces toward the church, not toward the rest of the world. He said, what do you mean? He said, honestly, use the billboard to encourage your people to be what God has called them to be. You have the best sales force and the largest sales force in your town. The problem isn't that you don't have people that can sell your message. The problem is they're not on board with your message. And until they are, Nobody's buying what you're selling because they ain't selling it. Let me say it this way. If you live like them, you got nothing they want. So trying to be relevant, we become like them. And what did Jesus say? Matthew 6, 8, do not be like them. That was the message he hammered out. Francis Chan wrote this. Brooke Bronkowski was 14 years old when she wrote these deep and touching words in an article in her journal called since I have my life before me, she wrote, I'll live my life to the fullest, 14 years old. I'll be happy. I'll brighten up. I will live more joyfully than I ever have been. I will be kind to others. I will loosen up. I will teach others about Christ. I will go on adventures and change the world. I will be bold and not change who I really am. I will have no troubles, but instead help others with their troubles. You see, I will be one of those people who live to be a history maker, even at a young age. Oh, I'll, I'll have my moments, good and bad, and I'll wipe away the bad and remember the good. In fact, that's all I'll remember, just the good moments, nothing in between, just living my life to the fullest. I'll be the one of those people who go somewhere with a mission, an awesome plan, a world-changing plan, and nothing will hold me back. I'll set an example for others. I'll pray for direction. I've, I have my life before me. I will give others the joy that I have. And God will give me just more joy. I'll do everything God tells me to do. I'll follow the footsteps of God. I'll do my best. During her freshman year in high school, Brooke was killed in a car accident while driving to the movies. Her life on earth ended when she was just 14, but her impact did not. Nearly 1,500 people attended Brooke's memorial service. People from her public high school read the poems that she had written about her love for God. Everyone spoke of her example and her joy. I shared the gospel and invited those, this is Francis speaking, invited those to know Jesus to come up and give their lives to him. More than 200 students gave their life to Jesus at that service. On their knees in front of the church, asking God to save them, ushers gave a Bible to each one of them. They were Bibles that Brooke had kept in her garage, hoping to give them all to her unsaved friends. In one day, Brooke led more people to the Lord than most people ever will in their lifetime. In her brief 14 years on earth, Brooke was faithful to Christ. Her short life was not wasted. The words from her essay seemed prophetic. You see, I will be one of those people who make history at a young age. It's important for you to understand that God gave you a new life, but he also gave you a new opportunity. And you're standing on the edge of that new opportunity. And when we come back, I want to tell you what happens next. And it's not fun. What happens next is Noah blows it. You have any mistakes in your life that you'd like to never have anybody else find out about? Well, we're going to come back and we're going to take a look at Noah's stupidest day in life.